<laughs> so, so tonight I want to just tell you a little bit about our backyard wildlife project before um, before I introduce Kristen and Catherine. So, um, Kameno is a community wildlife habitat. And we've done that by um, having a lot of people certify as backyard wildlife habitats. So we've done, this is our community action step. So I kind of pinched this from one of Catherine's programs, but I, um, I quite like this map because it's kind of a good visual to see all the habitat that's lost. And so we don't have control over a lot of things that go on, but we do have control over our yards. And if a lot of us um, are thinking about wildlife habitat and how we can connect our backyards, then we can connect with the parks on the island and, um, and restore some corridors. So that's our goal um, and our, our hope in our community action step. So it's, um, it's a simple thing to do. And, um, and here's where I live. So we moved, well, we moved to the island on Veterans Day in 1994. And so you can see we had some trees and a, a nice vista over the, um, and looking out at the water. However, now we've kind of changed that, that we live down at the bottom of the hill. So, um, so the top part now is, is back to wildlife habitat like it was originally. So we didn't do it all at once. So 1994, we um, just putzed around with what was there. And then the, the bottom shot is where we filled in the left-hand side, and that was about 2007. And now on the right-hand side picture, you can see that we have all wildlife habitat now. So, and we've done that by having um, ground cover, shrubs and tall trees and medium trees. So it's a true habitat so that everything can kind of hide. It's a great spot on a hot summer day. And, um, and then we can do this. And it's like our, our neighbors just chopped down eight beautiful trees. And um, so there's, there's less habitat on the other side, but there's, there's still habitat where we are, and there's still a big buffer along the road that's kind of a continuous um, habitat. So the goal is that um, we can work with the community and with our neighbors and with people to protect habitat and keep the space for the critters. So the, to have a wildlife habitat is providing food, water, shelter, and places to raise young. And so the food and the places to raise young um, all are kind of, and the shelter all kind of come about with the, with native plants and what we plant in our yards. And then the water is, a, it's a simple feature to add if you don't uh, have it just there. And that is just going to be as simple as a little um, bottom of a flower pot. And then you add some rocks and things in so that there's not just steep edges and it's not slippery. So it can be a simple little water uh, source to have a wildlife habitat. There's also another aspect and that's responsible gardening. So there's lots of different ways to do that. And um, reducing the lawn is, is a big, big help because grass and a tree parking it out is, is a real sterile environment. However, the growing the natives makes it uh, really lush and like you have your own little oasis, especially in a hot day. And it also is doing a lot for the critters. And a lot for our, our single source aquifer there with the ground, with um, water con conservation. And, um, and then the idea is that you don't have to be perfect in your wildlife habitat. And so you may not um, be willing to limit pesticide use and fertilizer use at first. And then you start to think about what you're doing in your yard and, and you're feeding the birds. Maybe you need to think about, maybe we need to think about different aspects. So it, it kind of helps to be a conscientious gardener when you when certifying as a wildlife habitat and when we have a bunch of people doing it we can um, go and be a community wildlife habitat and it's an action step and it's a cool action step i'll show you a map of all the communities in washington state in a little bit so to be a certified wildlife habitat it's a simple application you can find this one on our website coming to wildlifehabitat.org and it's a simple way of you just check off how you're providing food, water, shelter, places to raise young. And, and then you, you mail this to me and then I kind of watchdog it through the National Wildlife Federation. If you're a Camino resident, if you're off Camino, then 
or if you're on Camino and want to do it online, you just go to National Wildlife Federation and you can certify online. And then once you've certified, if you want, you can put up signs. We have a special one in Camino that was to help bump us over a thousand and we now have a thousand forty six certified habitats on the island or you can get the Ranger Rick sign from National Wildlife Federation. These signs are great advertisements. It's like it does two things. One, it kind of makes your yard purposeful because backyard wild habitats, since you're letting seeds kind of stay on the on the branches and and letting things grow a little bit wilder. Um, this the sign makes it purposeful as well as yard art. And so here are the dots on the island. This is when we had a 700. We haven't refreshed it. So now there should be, you know, about 350 more dots than what are there. Um, so it's a cool project and you can see the dots are all throughout the islands and um, and restoring some corridors. So that's the goal and that's what we're continuing to do. We started the project in 2002 and um, certified in 2005 and now you can see there are 18 certified wildlife habitats in the Puget Sound area. So to the National Wildlife Federation we're kind of a regional wildlife habitat um, with all these communities that are wildlife habitats. And there are now 158 in the nation. So for more information, you can go to the National Wildlife Federation um, and find out about, you know, certifying directly, or you can go to our website. Roxy's done a great job. We've got lots of resources on that. You can go and look at all our past programs, like there's one on native, there's several on native plants. There's um, one on planting on a drain field, which is a rock star hit of our programs and all sorts of things are available at, at our website. And a native plant list, that's, that's excellent. It kind of tells you how to plant the native plants in shady or, or um, uh, sunny spots, dry or, or wet, narrow or wide. And so it's a great resource by layers. And it goes along with uh, Snohomish Conservation District's um, catalog for their sale. And, and so you can see what works and what they're selling. Other references are the, the Living with Wildlife and Landscaping for Wildlife, and that is written by Russell Link. He's a biologist for the State Fish and Wildlife um, Department. And you can also access some of that information directly from the Fish and Wildlife website. And then the bottom book, Attracting Birds, is the National Wildlife Federation's um, bird about, a book about backyard wildlife habitats. That is more um, generic, a little bit more East Coast, while well, the two on top are definitely Pacific Northwest. And with that, um, thank you for all that are here that ha are part of our wildlife habitat. And if you want to get more involved and certified, just check out our website. And with that, I will um, uh, end my spiel and introduce Kristen and Catherine. So I stopped the share. And, um, oh, and I, I, and I, we won't have a December program, so I'll say that now and, and check our website for the coming ones. We haven't got a January speaker yet, so I, I can't tell you that information. But I can tell you about Kristen and Catherine. So they both work for the Snohomish Conservation District that has done uh, a number of programs for us. And, um, and this one is, is a good one because we all have um, some worries maybe with slopes and, um, and what to do with wetlands and, and bluffs and forests. So this is great. Kristen is the Habitat Restoration and Floodplain Management Program Director for this Conservation District. She's, also, she's worked for the district for more than 10 years. She likes or loves working with people to help them improve or protect their streams, rivers, and wetlands. So this is the perfect program for her to tell us about the stuff. She's from Colorado and relocated to the Puget Sound in 2005. And since then, she's worked to help property owners, patrons, or partners and communities in the Stiligwamish, Snohomish, and Camino Island areas. And she has a master's in ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of Colorado. And Catherine, not only is she a wonderful, has been a wonderful volunteer for um, the Backyard Wildlife Project and was out there finding numerous speakers for us, um, and then realized that work and volunteering sometimes got to be overwhelming. So 
when she retires, we've got a spot for her. Um, anyway, she's the special project administrator. She provides special support for Camino Island residents. And she has a bachelor's in natural resources from Cornell University. She's also a National Wildlife Federation Habitat steward. And she has transformed much of her Camino Island home and into a pollinator, bird, and amphibian habitat. And she was on a garden tour two times, so you could have visited her wonderful spots. So with that, Catherine and Kristen are going to tell us about bluffs, forests, and wetlands. Thank you so much. Because you're seeing a wind. There we go. Okay. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Um, we're thrilled that you can be here uh, this evening. My name is Catherine, and um, with me is Kristen, my colleague that uh, has been a great colleague for many years now. Um, it, we are recording this, but you're all muted and your videos are muted, so you can stay incognito if you like. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I will watch that, and then we can stop um, at certain sections when you have questions as well. You can raise your hand using the uh, raise hand feature on the bottom of your screen in this Zoom meeting. All right, so today we're gonna to talk a little bit about what Snohomish Conservation District is and what we do, um, a few of Camino Island's ecosystems, finding how to, where to find resources, particularly for those of you who live near bluffs and shorelines, because those can be a little trickier to uh, live near, um, and then how Snohomish Conservation District can help um, you as individuals, your neighborhood, and businesses, even in on Camino. Snohomish Conservation District, as uh, along with all the other conservation districts in the nation, were born out of the Dust Bowl era uh, as the uh, extreme drought and winds and combined with some farming practices of the time led to the loss of tons of topsoil from the Great Plains era, um, area. Um, the Soil Conservation Service began on a federal level to find ways to change farming practices to retain the soil, that precious topsoil that grows our food. Um, and then conservation districts were developed to work with people on the ground. So you have the federal arm and then you have the local group, the people who work with the cooperators, we call them cooperators, the farmers at the time. Now we work with many different people. Um, we're non-regulatory, so meaning we, you know, we can help people understand some of the regulatory codes that apply to them, but we do not enforce them. And we can um, provide guidance in how to help them stay in compliance with certain codes to, around like shorelines and bluffs and things like that. We provide free technical and sometimes financial assistance to people who land managers, so it's whether it's a property owner or somebody who is... Um, uh, operating on the property with the permission of the, the landowner, um, both in Snohomish County and Camino Island. For those of you, uh, if any of you are on Whidbey Island, Whidbey Island has a conservation district, uh, the Whidbey Island Conservation District. And then those of you who may be joining us from other regions, if you are in Washington State, most likely your county has its own um, conservation district. Not all conservation districts extend just to the county like you, us, we uh, take care of Snohomish County and Camino Island. Um, you may be part of Cascadia, for example, conservation district in their area. So you can check that out. And if you have questions about where to find your conservation district, just let us know. We work, like I said, with rural and urban residents. We work primarily to improve habitat, soil health and productivity. Resiliency is a really important topic these days and water quality through uh, actions that are best management practices. How do you retain soil health? How do you take good care of the trees on your property? How do you take good care of the, the wildlife potential um, on your property? We'll talk about four different ecosystems. There are more, uh, and you can get kind of macro or micro with those. We'll talk about wetlands and small streams, the forests on Camino, shorelines, including bluffs, 
and critical areas. And uh, Kristen will define that. What is a critical area? So we'll help you understand what we mean when we talk about that. Um, one overarching theme with these is native plants. Um, Val made mention of those, and we do have an annual native plant sale, um, which will be opening up for pre-orders in January. We don't have not set the date yet. Uh, native plants are adapted to our climate and soils. They have a really great ability to resist native pests and diseases. They require less water once they're established. So the first few summers, the first few dry seasons, they'll need additional water. But after that, you give their roots a good start, they'll hold on and do really well. And then, of course, very importantly, uh, our insects and animals evolved with the plants. And so they're, it provides, native plants provide year-round habitat and resources for those animals, for those insects. Um, if you have more questions about the plant sale, just let me know. I will turn it over to Kristen now, um, and we'll start talking about small streams. Great. Thanks, Catherine. Um, yeah, and I just want to say thank you for having us here today to the um, Camino Wildlife Habitat Project. Um, it's really, I think I've presented once here before many years ago, and um, it's always really a great experience for me. Um, I, I really appreciate being able to come to these events, and I also appreciate everyone rescheduling when uh, I, my family and I were, were ill a couple months ago, so thank you. Um, I will also caveat this presentation. Um, I am, as you heard when, in Val's introduction, I am a generalist, um, not a specialist. So I'm not a geotechnical engineer. I'm not a coastal geomorphologist. Um, so I'm going to present kind of high level generalist information. Um, and my role is really to try to connect you with, with those specialists um, or those specialist resources. Uh, but I will do my, my very best to... Um, yeah, get into the, the topics that you all are interested in. Um, I'll also note, mention just that this is, Camino Island in particular is an incredible community. Um, I actually see a few people on this um, meeting who knew me way back when I was an intern and first moved up here um, and who I've actually learned a huge amount from um, in my professional career. So um, yeah, it, it's a great community that has a lot of incredible knowledge and expertise. Um, it's a really well-educated community. So I'll do my best um, and uh, yeah, try to connect you with, with the resources that can help you. Um, so the first ecosystem that we're gonna talk about today briefly are the small streams on Camino Island. Um, the small streams have really uh, become elevated in importance, recognized, at least recognized um, as really important habitat in recent years. I think a lot of people we already knew that um, and really respected these streams, um, but there are a few studies that have come out over the past 10 or 15 years that have really highlighted the importance of Camino Island streams in particular to um, Puget Sound and Port Susan and um, the Salish Sea, kind of going back and down in, in scale. Um, a lot of Camino Island streams um, are small and they may be seasonal. Um, but they provide really important habitat um, for many different um, different types of wildlife, including amphibians and birds and um, also aquatic wildlife insects seasonally. Um, and then a lot of these small streams are really essential fish habitat for the young, um, the juvenile fish, the young fish that are coming out of other systems, other river systems like the Snohomish, the Stillaguamish, and the Skagit. Um, and so they, as those young fish migrate out into Port Susan and um, broader Puget Sound, they may go into these small streams um, to grow a little bit bigger and really um, adapt to that kind of salty environment. And so while, you know, while it may be a small stream and it may go dry, um, these can be really important habitat to protect. Next slide. One of the best and easiest things that people can do on their streams are to maintain, retain any vegetation, native vegetation that's growing along their streams. And this is a photo of some really great messy habitat. Uh, can't even tell that there's a stream there. Um, you see the layers of vegetation, different types of vegetation. It's really, really important um, for a lot of 
different benefits, not just to wildlife, um, but also to pollution filtration, um, cooling the water in if it's even if it's seasonal, um, there's some cooling benefits. Um, and then the those plants also provide a lot of soil stabilization along the stream. Um, a lot of people come to the conservation district to ask about hazard trees growing along streams. We'll talk a bit about hazard trees a couple different times throughout this presentation. Um, so even these small streams, these seasonal streams are considered critical areas, which are protected areas. And so um, if you have a dead tree, that actually provides an incredible, I'm oh, sorry, I'm gonna let this dog in so they don't bark. Um, snags and dead trees, um, which can be hazardous. Uh, they also provide a lot of an incredible habitat. So we try to leave those in place. Um, there are specific rules about um, what qualifies as a hazard tree in Island County Code. Um, a lot of times they're going to request that an arborist who is tree risk qualified um, is the one who determines if it's a hazard tree. It needs to be within some kind of striking distance um, from a structure to really be a hazard tree. And then, then they may allow you to take it out, but wherever you're possible, we try to retain those dead trees for habitat benefit. Next slide, please. Another important um, ecosystem type that uh, exists on Camino Island are wetlands. These are also critical areas or protected areas, both the wetland and then what we call a wetland buffer, the vegetation area or the area adjacent to the wetland. Um, and it can be really complicated how much of the area adjacent to a wetland is protected um, to officially answer that. Um, you would have to have a wetland delineation to figure out what type of wetland. And then that is a very prescriptive process where it says how wide that protective area is. That's not something a conservation district does. We are generally providing advice about um, how just maintaining, retaining that vegetation or enhancing your vegetation along your wetland. Um, and again, that's that's one of the best things that you can do to improve or protect your wetland um, is to keep native vegetation growing along the that edge of the wetland. And it's um, these provide a lot of benefits. They provide fish and wildlife habitat. Um, they also, uh, I think Val, you mentioned the so single source, sole source aquifer. Um, so wetlands are sponge. They hold a lot of water. Um, they hold our surface water, our rainwater, um, and they keep it there in the soil um, through the rainy season and store it into the summer, the dry season. So these are really important features to protect. Um, it really, wetlands are going to become increasingly, they're already incredibly important, but they're going to become increasingly important as we all um, continue to experience the impacts from climate change. Next slide. Um, and wetlands are lots of different types of wetlands. There are like shrub scrub wetlands. Um, there are more marshy wetlands. There are tidal wetlands and freshwater wetlands. There are forested wetlands. Um, so very diverse, um, lots of lots of different types of wetland habitat um, that exist. And they all, all serve a really important purpose. There are a couple really great examples of wetland habitat on Camino Island. Um, and specifically the ones we're highlighting are beaver created wetlands. There's um, a really great wetland across from the Casa Animal Shelter, um, the Camino, yeah, sorry, Camino Animal Shelter. Camino is, yeah, sorry, I forgot what that's called. Um, there's also another one next to Elder Bay Elementary. Um, Catherine or others can provide specific directions if you wanna take a little uh, walk out there on one of those if you have not found those yet. Um, go ahead to the next slide. I think people are really, we're hearing a lot about beaver um, over the past, I don't know, five to 10 years, um, really starting, uh, again, a lot of wildlife people, um, back, yeah, wildlife habitat people have known and understood and loved beaver for a long time for all the benefits that they provide. Um, in Western Washington, or you know, this area, actually all of, all of Washington, beaver play an incredibly important role in, um, creating habitat and maintaining habitat. Um, and of course, a lot of beaver were trapped out 
for many decades and um, with changes in law, our beaver populations are, are rebounding. Um, and we're starting to really see a lot more of those benefits from beaver habitat coming on onto the landscape. Um, they're incredible ecosystem engineers. The amount of water that can um, is held behind a beaver dam uh, or series of dams, it can be just incredible. Keeps the water cooler, recharges the groundwater, um, may recharge streams during imp important low flow uh, periods. So they're just um, where we can protect beaver habitat. We always want to try to do that. Next slide. Um, and this is just a really cool example um, from Dave Ward at Snohomish County from a couple decades ago. Um, go ahead and advance that uh, animation where um, you can see a series of uh, different dams that were created and abandoned by the beaver. They just kind of moved. I think they usually move downstream and continue to impound more water um, farther downstream. You can see how complex and messy and how there's just a lot of different um, incredible habitat benefits for all kinds of critters from birds to amphibians to fish and wildlife um, to aquatic insects. Um, the messier the better. Um, as beaver create habitat um, and transit and the vegetation community transitions from a forest community, it can transition into more of a shrubby wetland community. Another common question the conservation district gets is um, all those, a lot of trees start to die as they um, <clears throat> aren't adapted to having really wet feet. So again, that can create um, some kind of human um, habitat conflict uh, with, and what we hear a lot about is concerns um, related to hazard tree risk. Um, so again, these are protected habitats, critical areas. So consult an arborist and consult the county um, before you take any action along um, these, these wetlands, um, especially as that vegetation community is transitioning from a forested area to, um, to more of a wetland habitat. I might pause here and see if there are any questions because I'm, I know I'm going at a brisk clip. I am oh. not seeing any in the chat. Okay. All right. Well, we can go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that the conservation, oh yeah, thanks. <laughs> one thing that the conservation district can do is try to help people live with beavers. Um, there are a couple different incredible programs in um, the Puget Sound area uh, and a couple different great organizations who are doing work in this area the conservation district, we can provide a free site visit if you are experiencing flooding um, or blocked culverts or are concerned about hazard trees or that vegetation changing as a beaver wetland is being created. Um, we also get a lot of questions about tree chew. It can be really devastating to lose some of your trees. Um, and there are ways that we can help. Next, or next slide for the animation. Um, so we can provide... Um, Definitely advice, and then sometimes we can provide um, cost share support for helping deal with um, these these impacts to beavers. Um, one one common one that we would think about on Camino Island is flooding impact to drain fields or septic systems. Really, or yeah, primarily drain fields. Um, and there are options for how we can um, reduce the level of that dam, but also keep that dam in place, keep the beaver habitat in place, just try to manage it a little. Um, we also know several um, relocation uh, organizations. So there are organizations where, um, where beaver conflict is negatively impacting um, roads or drain fields, and there isn't a really a solution to keep that beaver on the landscape. There are options other than the lethal control. Um, and Tulalip Tribes is one of the relocation um, organizations, but the, the Department of Fish and Wildlife has a relocation certification program where, um, where they're getting contractors um, and other organizations and companies certified, I think is what it's called, to relocate beaver. And the idea there is that they um, trap the beaver in places where there are conflicts um, and there's a pretty robust uh, kind of assessment program, and then they relocate those 
beaver their entire families up into kind of upland areas on right now i think it's mostly dnr department of natural resources land um where we we have a lot more capacity for beaver um, and we really need those beaver working in those forests to store water for us next slide um so as i said planting stream or planting your streams and your wetlands with native vegetation is um, really the single best thing you can do to improve wildlife habitat, um, protect water quality, and really increase our climate resilience on Camino Island in this region. Um, here are a couple examples of some of our stunning uh, native plants. We have salmonberry, which is a really early, um, early uh, food source, the flowers are. Um, twinberry, is a great, beautiful plant. Lots of hummingbirds and other pollinators love it. And then spirea is that plant on the, the right. Um, you'll see this a lot in wetlands. It can form really thick, um, well, thickets, <laughs> um, but it's also a really great wetland plant and hedge. Thanks, yeah, thanks guys, see that comment. I saw that a few people uh, mentioned that they have forest property. Oh yeah, thanks, Catherine. You're you're doing great. <laughs> I'm, I'm anticipating my slide transitions. Um, I saw that there are a few people who own um, forests or uh, timberland who are in this meeting. Um, a lot, much of Camino was forested prior to European American um, exploration and settlement on Camino Island, um, and that slide that. Uh, Val showed earlier of that, I think it was 1994 and 2020 change in the amount of forest cover um, on the land in Camino or on Camino um, is, is a pretty, um, it can be disheartening, but uh, it's also something that we can change here um, by reforesting um, or protecting our existing forests. Uh, forests provide incredible habitat um, for all kinds of wonderful wildlife that we all love to see, um, including woodpeckers and porcupines, bats, owls, all kinds of habitat. Uh, next slide. One thing we're aiming for in forests um, is a lot of layers and a lot of diversity. Um, so in this photograph or these two photographs, you can see that there's some layering of, um, of the forest vegetation. We have ground cover. Um, we have so things like uh, Doug Dole Oregon grape or Kinnikinnick, um, some of those sword fern. And then we get into the shrub layer um, where we might have oso berry, which um, is also sometimes known as Indian plum or vine maple. Um, and then you get into that really tall canopy of Douglas fir, Western red cedar, Western hemlock are some of our more dominant species. Um, next slide. So again, replanting cleared areas um, and trying to think about creating layers. Um, now, not everyone can plant a giant, <laughs> um, a Douglas fir or a Western red cedar in their, their backyard um, or in their yard because you don't want that growing right up on top of your house. Um, but you can still um, replant areas with different, different layers of vegetation, whatever's appropriate for the size of your property. Um, and again, two of our more common trees that you would see um, on Camino Island are this Douglas fir and Western red cedar. Next slide. Catherine and I wanted to show some examples of some of the ground covers because those can be a lot easier to find space for um, and really do contribute some great wildlife benefits. Um, so we have Salal here on the left and, uh, and right, sorry, um, showing just different um, the berries of the salal that can be um, great for habitat um, and it's an evergreen so it looks nice um, all year round. The conservation district, both Whidbey Island Conservation District and Snohomish Conservation District do offer forest health um, planning assistance and um, in some cases we can even offer um, cost sharing assistance for reforesting your property. Um, or um, yeah, reforcing your property or um, maintaining doing thinning to improve the health of your forest. 
Um, there's also been some really great work um, by the Island County commissioners on in, yeah. Um, and specifically uh, Commissioner St. Clair wanted us to, or I wanted to highlight some work that she did. Um, recently, I think it was January, 2023, Island County updated its code um, for public benefit open space rating system. And it includes the protection of wetlands and forests. And so what this does is really provide people who were in designated forest land, which is a taxation program, a, a tax benefit program to incentivize keeping lands or keeping forests in working forests. Um, the Island County has created this kind of off-ramp uh, pathway to provide another option for receiving tax benefits for keep for protecting um, and retaining forest and wetlands in native growth, um, but they don't have quite as high a bar as the designated forest land program, which is a de state department of natural resources program that has a has a pretty high bar for being able to get into and then stay in the program. The designated forest land program is really set up to keep lands working. So not only do you need a forest uh, management plan, but you actually need to be working toward, toward harvest. Um, so Island County has this new option. The public benefit rating system has existed for a long time, but now there's a new option for being able to leave designated forest land, um, but then still retain some tax benefit in protecting forests and wetlands. Um, so if that's, if you are one of those um, forest property owners who registered for this course and, and check the box for forest. Um, that's something we can provide information about or the Island County Assessor um, can provide, Assessor's Office can provide information. Um, our foresters also provide wildfire resilience and preparedness um, planning. And um, we also have a crew now who can do some, um, if you qualify for cost share assistance, um, we might even be able to do some uh, wildfire risk reduction projects. That program is really launching in 2024, so I don't think we'll have it off the ground till maybe 2025, but I did want to mention that as a coming attraction. I'll pause here, see if there are any questions or comments. I don't have anything in the chat, but if you want to raise your hand, you are welcome to do so or put something in the chat. Yeah. Okay, I will continue on. Um, so I saw a lot of people registered um, indicating that they're either interested in shorelines and bluffs or own property or and or live on shorelines and bluffs. So we wanted to talk about this. Um, very unique, very interesting, and sometimes very challenging um, habitat. Camino Island has over 50 miles of shoreline. Um, and within that shoreline, there are different landform or ecosystem types. We have sandy and rocky beaches. Um, we have embayments or small estuaries um, that are at the base of or uh, near bluffs or maybe at, um, at the outlet of a small one of those small streams. Um, and all of these different eco habitat types or ecosystems really provide critical habitat for fish, birds, and vertebrate mammals. Um, and they are also really essential. Some of these habitat types are really essential to creating new habitat. So feeder bluffs in particular are really essential in creating um, the processes that happen on feeder bluffs are really important for creating those sandy beaches. So we need to keep in mind just not just the importance of the habitat, but also the habitat forming processes that are that are happening. Next slide. And these shorelines are really um, exist um, because of the glaciation uh, that built Camino Island. Um, so there are just layers of silt and clay and gravels and sand. Um, is what makes up Camino Island. And often on these um, bluffs, you can see the different layers um, of glacial deposits and, and glaci glacially formed um, material. Next slide. But along with these incredibly stunning um, shorelines, there can be some real challenges on um, living and managing 
um, those areas. So slope stability um, and erosion are really big concerns um, on our shorelines, not just bluffs, but also on um, those beaches and other, other areas. Um, invasive plants is another question we receive a lot at the conservation district and one that we um, are qualified to, to answer. Um, and then there are just view and other considerations um, that people have. Um, it's what drew drew people to purchasing property uh, out here. Um, but then it also comes with um, some real challenges with, with managing and protecting that property. Next slide. Uh, we commonly hear a lot of questions on bluff properties about uh, maintaining views. In fact, um, many HOAs have um, rules or covenants that actually um, require tree removal for view maintenance or view corridors. Um, so wherever possible, we recommend that people um, try to retain the existing native vegetation on their slope and or their bluff and think about alternative strategies for um, creating or maintaining your view. And one of, one of those practices or some of those practices are different limbing practices. Um, and you can really frame your view. I'm not a photographer, um, but I've talked with a lot of photographers about um, trying to you know, use trees and um, limbed trees to help frame your view. And it can really help um, kind of keep, uh, enhance the aesthetic on your property. Um, we do recommend that if you are required or considering doing any um, work with limbing on your property, one is you need to uh, consult county code um, to make sure that that is required. Any removal of vegetation, trees, um, or shrubs along a bluff, that is another protected critical area um, with these buffers or setbacks that are protected. Um, so you need to consult with Island County Code and we'll provide some resources for how you can actually figure out what um, kind of what those protections are. Um, but two, if you are considering doing some limbing, um, find an ISA certified arborist and International Society of Ar yeah, Arbor Culture. Um, those, uh, and you can do that a simple web search to find those ISA certified arborists. They're going to be able to provide um, recommendations about and maybe even do the limbing for you. Next slide. Uh, so on those on these shorelines, whether it's a bluff or a different type of shoreline, um, we're really working with um, the existing conditions. So I, I said, you know, Camino Island is a big lump of sand, silt, gravel, clay, um, and we can't change that. No matter what we do, we can't change that um, that soil that exists, and it really contributes to. Um, shoreline erosion. So you look at the different layers of soil. Um, and then we also have wave action that we cannot. Um, oops, Catherine, you switched over. <laughs> um, we can't control the wave action. Um, and we really can't control how water's moving beneath us. But there are a few things that homeowners, um, property owners, land managers can control to help protect themselves. Um, so one of the big things is really thinking about how water moves across your property and then enters into the soil um, and moves down the slope. So when we remove vegetation, um, we can really destabilize those soils and accelerate erosion, whether that's surface erosion with kind of slides or um, it's more like a deep uh, soil movement that is kind of shifting the whole slope. Um, next slide. Vegetation is, so as I mentioned, I'm not a geotechnical engineer. Um, so a lot of my, my advice is going to focus on um, vegetation management because that is a place where I can provide some advice to you. Um, where I'm qualified to provide advice to you. Um, so a lot of what I do when, I, when we go, or our, our teams, when our staff go out to properties is really try to provide advice about um, planting along the top of the bluff, um, what types of vegetation will help um, reduce that, um, that movement. Now, on a steep slope like this, on a bluff, um, 
there's not a heck of a lot um, that we can do to stop that movement. This is this is just a natural process. Um, so what we can do is improve our management practices to not um, accelerate what's happening or um, create additional problems. So we're really looking at retaining vegetation um, and having a diversity of rooting structures. And really what that does is um, the above ground vegetation can intercept the water, slow the water down when, when we have precipitation. Um, and then if we have grass and shrubs um, and leaf litter on the ground, that can slow or prevent um, the, the rain water from kind of collecting and sheet flowing across the surface and then um, potentially picking up eroding our top or the top layers of soil. Um, by having a diversity of rooting structures, so some deep rooting and some shallow rooting vegetation, we're really um, increasing uh, the amount of roots that are holding that soil together. And we also increase that infiltration into, um, into the soil so that it's, we're reducing the amount of water that's flowing across the top and might mobilize our soil. Next slide. So some of the plants that you'll see or that we'll recommend, um, Pacific Madrone is a great, great example of trees that you'll see on Camino Island um, and that can do, can tolerate these really challenging conditions. Next slide. Uh, we also uh, recommend planting service berry and you'll see these um, naturally recruiting on these really um, challenging habitat types. And they also provide a lot of great wildlife benefit. Uh, I already mentioned vine maple as a great, um, great plant that provides, um, but it is another great plant for not just in your forest, um, but along your bluff um, or shoreline. It has great deep wide rooting structure. Um, and then evergreen huckleberry, which um, is great habitat for humans too, because they're delicious. Um, but that's another one um, that we see a lot of people plant um, that can tolerate these really challenging exposed um, habitats or yeah, conditions um, and grow well. Next slide. Uh, we end up planting a lot of nook a rose on our projects because they're so hardy um, and they, um, do really well on these uh, on a lot of Camino Island habitat or, uh, or Camino Island habitats, um, and then tall Oregon grape is another great species to plant. Next slide. A couple more recommendations. Um, snowberry is one of my uh, another one of my favorites to plant on our project sites. Um, it does really well in a, in a variety of conditions, um, and provides some great. Um, habitat for nesting birds. And then ocean spray is one that's probably underappreciated, but I think it's um, it's getting a little bit more common to see in, in nurseries or it has been for quite a while. But um, when I started in like 2005, 2010, you weren't see, I didn't see it as often in um, nurseries. And those are kind of medium shrubs. <clears throat> So I know we're getting toward the end of our time. So I wanted to talk a bit about some of the resources that are available to people. Um, a very old publication that I find myself referencing very often is the a guide for Puget Sound Bluff property owners. I think it was it was published in either 1993 or 1994, um, and it is just a really great resource that has um, really relevant information. Um, it's not as you know photographically appealing as some of our, our newer resources, but it's one that I return to time and again um, for really learning about how to manage um, property on slopes. Um, it gets into kind of what to look for, um, like how, uh, what, what kind of risks or hazards to look for um, and watch for if you're starting to be concerned about erosion or slides on your, your bluff or your shoreline. Um, so I can't recommend that one enough. Next slide. Uh, there are also, um, there's a company on Whidbey Island um, that has a lot of great resources. And one that I often share with people is the slope revegetation checklist um, so that you can kind of think through as you're planning what to do on your property um, or what to plant. 
you have your own little checklist that you can go through um, as you're developing your plan. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, we're not, I'm not a geotechnical engineer. Uh, neither Whidbey Island Conservation District nor the Snohomish Conservation District have a geotechnical engineer on staff. And so um, we can't refer people to any specific company, but we have created a list of geotechnical service providers who we've heard provide services on Camino Island. So you can access um, that list and it's really meant as a starting point for your own internet search. We've also compiled a list of native plant nurseries um, so people can figure out where, where are the best places to go buy native plants. Um, all conservation districts in Wash, at least in Western Washington, have their own native plant sale. Um, they are, sales are actually starting now. I think Whidbey might already have their sale open, um, but they sell low cost native trees and shrubs, usually seedlings or um, either bare root or um, even like just root stock um, that you can buy for low cost and then put on your property. Um, but there are a number of other great nurseries and there are a lot of nurseries that are popping up. Um, there's one, I live down in Lake Forest Park um, and I found a nursery a few years ago that is just out of some person's backyard in Shoreline. And so, um, and they provide great plants. Um, so, you know, we keep, if you find a new nursery that's not on our list, email us because um, we wanna make sure we're, we're getting those um, nurseries out to people so people can find great native trees and shrubs. Next slide. Another um, incredible resource in Island County is the Island County Shore Friendly Program. Um, they also offer uh, free site visits um, and have um, programs that can some um, that you can apply to for um, to help you with your own project. They also offer videos, publications, and workshops. Um, so I think there you can go to this website to request a site visit. Seems like they're booking a couple months out. I think um, people know about this program and it's it's incredibly popular. Um, I often recommend that people ask the conservation district out and then also invite Shore Friendly out separately um, because I think it's always a good idea to get as many, as much free advice as you can. Um, and then they, they do have a lot more very shoreline specific information. Um, they're getting a little bit more specialized whereas um, we're a little bit more generalist. Next slide. Um, shore, the Mason Conservation District has a great shore friendly, or maybe it's Mason County, has a great shore friendly program. Um, and we like to highlight some of their fact sheets. They're very attractive. They're very easy to use. Um, so that's a great place to go and um, look for resources. Next slide. And then the WSU Extension Shore, Shoots, shore Stewards Program um, have a number of great resources and, and publications. And this is one um, that we wanted to highlight um, about the beach processes, especially related to feeder, feeder bluffs creating beaches. Next slide. The Conservation District also has um, our own fact sheets and um, you can go to our website to request a site visit. Um, I saw at least one person who's received a site visit from us and, and that person can attest. It can take a while for us to get out there. Um, we are, you know, we only have a certain number of staff um, and then it can take a while to get, um, get things wrapped up, but we can provide um, that free technical assistance. Um, so feel free to reach out on that on our website. Next slide. And then I mentioned um, that Island County has some great tools available for people to really start to understand if you live on a critical area and um, what you need to think about ahead of doing any work on your property. So this IC Geo map is really important and it's the first place I go when someone requests a site visit. I wanna see, do they have streams? Do they have potential wetlands on their property? And are they in one of those geologically hazardous areas that will have additional rules and um, requirements for doing work along your property? So I would, Again, anytime you're doing vegetation work, um, removing vegetation or limbing trees, doing any of that kind of stuff um, or building, especially if you're doing any kind of new building, um, I really recommend you go check out that map and just get to know um, what rules may impact what you can do on your property. The Conservation District can also provide free advice about that. 
Next slide. Um, you can also contact Island County Planning and Community Development directly, go straight to the horse's mouth to ask questions. Next slide. Um, yeah, and I've already talked about this, that we have some financial support um, and offer free site visits. Next slide. Um, there are some great projects that have happened on Camino Island um, as far as reforesting former ag pastures um, and planting along streams and rivers. Um, I suspect that a couple people on the uh, slideshow were actually out there planting trees back in 2010 when some of this work happened. Next slide. Uh, the Conservation District also offers events like this, workshops and events, um, and then we try to get out there into your community um, through uh, schools and then also in community events like the Camino Living um, or Camino 101, sorry. Next slide. Whew. Okay. <laughs> Let's see if there are any questions or I always, I always see, I'd love to hear other advice people have or other resources people have. Everyone should be able to unmute yourself if you if you have a question. Yeah. Val just dropped um, information about a feeding and caring for wild birds in the winter event that's at the Paws and Wings place on Camino Island. That's um, behind, or not behind, slightly behind, but just north of the Camino Island IGA Plaza, Camino Plaza. So that's a, a neat little shop um, if you're um, in that area. I can't Catherine, recommend that as, yes. If you send me a list of the links, I can post them on our website. Yes, I will do that. Because you have some really cool things there that I hadn't seen before. So uh -huh. this is really fun. So Good. I wasn't fast enough writing them all down. So yes, well, we can we can also provide a, a PDF. Um, well, and... actually, will, will that go out in in the um, app? It'll, it'll go to the people that I can identify from the um, from the participants list. Um, some people just have, for example, iPad. Um, right. So I don't know who that is. But if you want a PDF, um, you can uh, send me a message, um, email me, let me know, or you know if they want to. Yeah, it'd be easier if they just contact me, um, Catherine at snohomishcd.org, and I'd be happy to send out that PDF uh, to everyone who requests it. And then we'll have this recording available on. Um, I think we'll have it on our YouTube page for sure. And then I think I can share that with you guys, uh, the Camino Wildlife Habitat Project, and they can have it on their page as well. I'm going to cool. stop recording, speaking of which. Um, let's see here. Ah, wait a minute. If you send me a, a link, I can just put the link with our programs. It doesn't have to be on our website. Okay. 